Yes, okay, uh, we'll call the meeting to order. This is special call design review committee meeting of March 22nd. And if the commissioners will please respond when I call your name for the official roll call. Kelly Baker. Present. Susan Besser. Present. Brian Laster. Present. Nick Mann. Present. Lisa Marquardt. Present. Mary Pierce. I saw you. Uh, present. Thank you. Ken Scalf. I don't think Ken is here. Ken is not here today. Okay. Kathy Worthington. Present. And Jim Roberts here. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion now to approve resolution 2021-22, a resolution declaring that the design review committee shall meet on March 22nd, 2021, and consider its essential business by electronic means rather than being required to gather a quorum of the members physically present in the same location because it is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of COVID-19 outbreak. Is there such a motion? So moved, Mrs. Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mary. Okay, then please respond when I call your name. Kelly Baker. Aye. Susan Besser. Aye. Brian Laster. Aye. Nick Mann. Aye. Lisa Marquardt. Aye. Mary Pierce. Aye. Uh, Ken, Kathy Worthington. Aye. And Jim Roberts. Aye. Due to the COVID-19 outbreak, this meeting will be a virtual meeting. The purpose of the meeting will be to conduct a design review workshop. No discussions on applications will be made at the meeting. The public may call into the conference meeting to listen at 312-626-6799, meeting ID 9417685-9214, passcode 049510. The public may email comments to planningintake at franklintn.gov to be provided in full to the commission and included in the minutes, but not read aloud during, the entire, during their entirety during the meeting. Emailed comments will be accepted until 4 p.m. on the day before the meeting. The meeting video will be available for public viewing 24 hours following the meeting of the City of Frank on the City of Franklin YouTube account. Um, today's meeting, uh, the DRC is a subcommittee of the Historic Zoning Commission. The meeting is informal and has been called to provide guidance to the city's consultants as they work toward a proposal for a new city hall building. Studio 8 Design, Matt Taylor and Anna Ruth Kimbrough will be presenting information about the site's historical context. They will also show examples from other communities and will be seeking committee feedback on the presentation. So Matt and Anna Ruth, welcome. It's the show is yours. Thanks, Jim. It's good to see you. Um, good to see you. Been a while. I know it. I know it. Um, thank you guys for all taking the time to do this special meeting. Um, we know you've got a lot going on and you've had a lot of meetings lately. So we really appreciate y'all being here. Um, you can see uh, Anna Ruth there pictured in the boxes of Hollywood Squares. And I also want to um, <laughs> find out, introduce Matt Edwards with OHM, who's our design partner on the project as well. So um, we're, we're all excited to be here. And I as I assume many of you are excited to be talking about a potential new city hall. So um, the phase that we're in now is really about the programming and working towards developing, uh, doing a, a lot of public input and developing an overall high level master plan um, towards the end of the year, uh, getting approval for that and then really starting building design next year. So we're in the case study research uh, portion of this first phase. Uh, I'm going to walk through our historic uh, and context case study with you all. I'm sure a lot of this um, you all will be familiar with because of who you are and your involvement with the city. But um, I am going to try and move through this front part um, kind of quickly because I think some of it will be familiar territory for y'all. But we want to try and leave uh, time for questions and discussion at the end. So um, ordinarily, we're all about discussion, but I think if we can walk through this, we can always jump back to things if you guys would like to. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and um, get this started for you. Uh, all 
Okay. Uh, can you see the aerial picture of the square there? Yeah. Matt, can yes. you zoom in just a tad? Um, yes. Well, I said yes. Well, maybe as we get to ones that have text. Yeah. Let, let's, let's see how that does. There we go. Um, okay. So introductory slide, we will go to the next page. Um, there's, there's kind of a couple of topics it, throughout all of our case studies, we've been talking about how to uh, connect the city um, the, and city hall with um, citizens to place, buildings to context and history to progress as we move through the design of the project. So we've really tried to look at this in a couple of different manners. Um, in the building to context, we're going to talk about site context, the, hi the hist history, architectural expression, and contextual relevance through this case study. Um, starting with the site context, uh, our design team and several members of the city staff um, joined us for a walkthrough around, uh, around the site. And these were notes of all of our observations, literally as we circled the square. Um, I'm not going to try and read all of these to you all. Um, I think you have a copy of the PDF and we'll let you, um, hopefully you've had a chance to read them. A couple of key elements. This is the existing city hall structure. This is the existing uh, courthouse with the square to remain. Um, we know this portion of the square has been used as a stage for a lot of uh, festivals and events. Um, we have the Third Avenue elevation has never been particularly lively along Third Avenue with the mall building. Um, and then we have a parking lot at the back on Church Street that uh, I think a lot of people would like to see uh, removed and uh, create a better uh, pedestrian downtown uh, face to the south end of the site as well. We're also very sensitive to the greenhouse and the theater uh, as historic structures that they will be saved and preserved and we don't want to encroach on them too much. And um, we'll literally be looking at the whole block even with the uh, existing parking garage planning to remain. Um, from a, a context standpoint, we did a couple of things. We looked at the map of downtown um, relative to height and massing, what sort of uses happen through there. Um, you can, uh, I think this is just a, a simpler graphic map. Uh, we've got more residential uses uh, in the gold um, here and here and here with uh, commercial and civic uses in some of these other structures between churches, um, diagonal corners, uh, the courthouse and biscuit love. Matt, I'll just add that, I, and I apologize. I just noticed this. the uh, The greenhouse is actually being used as a residence right now. Oh, is it okay? Yes. Okay. I actually didn't realize that. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, and I didn't notice it earlier. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, so, in looking at the views, uh, looking along Third Avenue. You uh, see at the south end, the, the Presbyterian Church, Biscuit Love, uh, we come up on the Moran Pope House, the alley between the courthouse uh, and, uh, and then the courthouse itself. Um, the, the character of the buildings changes from residential to more institutional, but we have a very strong historic uh, context along Third Avenue. Uh, Church Street, as a little bit lower scale, less dense with um, the gallery on the corner, uh, a lot of uh, kind of scrub brush and some support structures, and then the law offices and, and Anchor, Anchor Health's uh, office uh, with uh, Third Avenue being a primary gateway into the city from the interstate. Um, as we look at Second Avenue, we are separated by the parking garage, but the context is still important relative to this block and having the church and Masonic Lodge at the north end, uh, closest to Main Street, and then transitioning to the brownstones, which are residential, but actually step up in scale um, along uh, as we approach Church Street again. 
Um, physically, uh, those buildings take on very different scales. So looking, um, the gold is the existing city hall building that will be removed. Uh, you see the low scale uh, at Church Street with the buildings across the street, and then the higher scale along 2nd Avenue uh, fronting the parking garage and the theater and the greenhouse. Uh, so you, we look, um, uh, the opposite direction along 3rd Avenue, we've got uh, so the lower scale at Church Street and step up to the courthouse in 231 Public Square as we get uh, closer to Main Street. Uh, the, the historic buildings kind of flirt in between that with uh, their roof forms, but certainly a little more residential in scale than the scale of the courthouse. Uh, similarly, looking um, across the site, cutting, cutting through the courthouse and looking south, again, the scale of City Hall is actually pretty low compared to the parking garage and the courthouse in between. And then uh, with St. Phillips over on the uh, east side, um, looking north, <clears throat> excuse me, look, I'm sorry, looking south, the brownstones are pretty tall, but then the scale of everything else tends to drop again with um, the existing city hall, um, city hall building, the gallery, and, um, and, and the church with, with the steeple tower uh, popping up through that, that lower roof plane. Looking uh, at the history of the site, um, we have lots of great old pictures. So this site has seen a lot of change uh, through, through the years uh, in how it's been used, buildings that have uh, been located on, on, on the actual um, site where City Hall is now. We had um, uh, everything from grocery stores to uh, the, the blacksmith that serviced the, the buggies, uh, horse watering station. Here you can see historically the old uh, a city map of downtown with the density along Main Street. And then this is our site where similar to now the scale dropped off. But the corner was anchored uh, pretty solidly with um, the laundry and grocery store. Um, the, the blacksmith even was taller and stepped down as you approach that corner where you think of 231 Public Square now. Um, this is a little bit further out building uh, from our view from this side, where again, the, the anchor or the corner was anchored pretty solidly. Um, this was the old um, eventual car dealership um, and Arlington Hotel structure with the lower buggy building in between the two. Uh, but obviously it doesn't look anything like this today. Um, uh, stables are, were something that we found a lot in, around the downtown area, and they presented some really interesting architectural history. When you look at Cotton's livery stable up here, uh, closer to when it was originally built, and then later in life when it was uh, painted, um, it pulled on a lot of the downtown urban um, detailing with brick corbeling and the stepped parapet wall but it had these grand arches, which were intended to allow people as they came into town to literally drive their horse and buggy right through these arches. Um, it fit in a little bit more with the urban context rather than looking more uh, like, like a barn on a farm and um, were pretty solid structures. Um, there were a couple of these around. There you can see cottons in the, relative to the courthouse and where the laundry and, and uh, grocery were anchored up on the corner. Here's a view of that same, same view today, pretty close, where you see church, courthouse, and city hall. So it's a very different kind of streetscape now from what used to be there at one point. So as we're thinking about design strategies and what happens with the building, we looked at, into some of the history of, of things that supported the community. Um, Dr. Uh, Cliff maintained a garden along 2nd Avenue that was famous for its flowers. Uh, his grandson, uh, Joe, was an, one of the early aldermen of the city of Franklin. Both lived along 2nd Avenue 
Um, the flower garden was right where the parking garage is now, but um, that you know, seemed like a really interesting tie for green space downtown. Uh, the pie wagon is an old uh, tradition that everyone was aware of that um, was shown over here off of uh, 3rd Avenue, closer to the courthouse, before it moved up to the northeast or northwest corner of the uh, square later on. Um, the corner of 3rd Avenue, and Mary, I'd be curious if you know any of the history of this, but um, we, we've seen references to it as Water Trough Corner, where there was a water trough that served as a real gathering place, uh, really at the corner of somewhere close to the corner of 3rd and Public Square. Not been able to find it on a map. Uh, we've only heard anecdotal stories about it. But it, was, it served as a real crossroads where people came into town, they parked at the stables, they brought their horses here to water, they stopped at the grocery store and the laundry, and it was a real community gathering place, um, much like this quadrant of the square is now when we have festivals downtown. So looking at some of those elements on, on today's aerial map, the um, old livery stables were located mid block along Third Avenue. Then we also had two others up along Main Street. And these were all similar to that photo of Cottons with the, with the giant arch in the front. Um, the historic garden was here. We now have some potential for green space at the south end along Church Street around the greenhouse and next to the theater where we don't have some massing. The church corner provides uh, kind of a, an iconic landmark with, with the steeple. Um, we may and and looking for opportunities of how we may connect to the residential side of Second Avenue and the neighborhood, uh, and we're we're kind of looking for historic elements that we might be able to draw upon as we start looking at the forms and rhythms of what the new city hall might be. And Matt, uh -huh. I would add that the green space um, allows a little breathing room around the historic mm -hmm. structures, the greenhouse and the theater. There's a potential to allow some, you know, a nice park feature or green space around those and some breathing room from the building yeah. to the historic structures. Yeah, thanks Anna Ruth, that, that, that's exactly right. We've talked about that as helping to continue to buffer and protect uh, the setting of these two historic structures downtown. Um, as we look at some of the architectural expression of downtown, um, the original city plat uh, of the city grid, you can see was a very regular layout of the town. Um, equal, you know, modules for the lot sizes. Um, as we look at the actual architecture along Main Street, there's a pretty regular rhythm of the width of the buildings. This tends to be in the 24 to 25 foot range generally. Um, and then there's also pretty consistent height. Um, it, while, while there's some variation, um, there's really some, some unique rhythms and, and heights and geometries happening. The, um, most of the buildings were two to three stories. They had large storefront windows at ground level for where there were predominantly retail stores for display. And then um, punched window openings in the upper floors where you may have had offices or even some residences, uh, depending on the building and the time period. But even at the square, these same kind of rhythms and elements are, are still are seen with the, the base in the middle and the top, the consistent elevation, the punched windows and the display, uh, uh, storefront display at, at ground level. Um, looking at our site, there's a similar rhythm happening just on a different scale where um, these are more like 100 foot intervals that you start to see as we relate our site to the Third Avenue uh, rhythm with the courthouse spanning sort of two of those modules and then the ramp of Pope House, the Biscuit Love and the church. Um, the geometry of the square is obviously very important and something to protect. Um, we've had a lot of conversations about looking at the uh, facade of the courthouse and trying to uh, hold hold or relate to that line somehow in the construction of a new city hall and see the existing structure 
pushes uh, forward. A little bit proud of that line right now. Um, as some of you remember, when we brought 231 Public Square back in, that building set back off the edge and we added to the front to help repair that edge of the, of the square to retain that. Um, we've also looked at um, some of that green space that Enrith had mentioned too, and you see it really starts to be more predominant here at the south end uh, as everything transitions more to the neighborhood away from the uh, more dense Main Street uh, character and, and density. Um, the, this architectural expression of, of the arches uh, is something that we found and, and we don't see as much of anymore. There are a few left, but it was really largely a function of, of uh, these stable buildings. Um, we had a smaller entry arch here. Uh, the use of arched windows is a little more common, uh, but these, uh, these stable buildings had these really interesting um, architectural forms of the grand scale of the arch and just the real simple geometry. But you can see the brick detailing around the header of the arch and the corbeling that you see up here. Uh, the existing, uh, the original city hall office and fire department had an arch where the fire truck uh, parked, um, which then this is in the northeast corner of the square. You can still see the city offices uh, sign above the door there. And then, um, this is the um, uh, next to, uh, I can't remember now which bank that is, but um, the, the northwest corner of the square, this building and an arch are still standing. So again, as we look at what some of the other details and geometries uh, and materials are uh, throughout downtown now, there's a lot of uh, predominantly brick uh, there's stone and the lintels and the sills. Uh, there's corbeling and detailing around some of the windows. Um, again, here we have arches. 231 has arches, and we were able to pull some of that detailing back in when uh, this building was, was re completely rehabilitated. Um, you see photos along uh, Main Street with, again, some mixture of stone some of the wood storefronts, um, the, the brick details and keystones in the corner. Um, the old uh, grocery store had more of a stone facade to it, which is a little bit more unusual for downtown. Uh, and, and even um, along Main Street at, at the old Ben and Jerry's building there, um, you had that delineation of the base, the middle and the top between uh, the, the way the storefront and entries were handled um, the punched window openings uh, happen in the midst and the, and the metal coping at the top. So there's very strong relationships across even a variety of different styles through downtown that are still visible today. Uh, awnings in some cases uh, or um, the way the storefront was treated uh, helped to ground that, that pedestrian plane and bring, bring the scale of the building down to a human scale um, up and down Main Street as well. Um, so, some additional details, really seeing some of that brick corbeling. Um, this is all uh, uh, very similar to what we saw in the, in the uh, cotton livery stables. Um, the use of the, the sills and treating the window heads. Um, we've got a lot more ornament here in uh, in this sort of coping and, and larger parapet roof treatment. Um, but each of these buildings has treated its parapet in its own way to really give these buildings uh, more of a cap and a, and a, and a top to them uh, with some changes in plane with the different kinds of details uh, and materials uh, throughout the up and down Main Street and the downtown district. So we look at some of the contextual relevance uh, to downtown. Um, the arches are one of those things that we, it, it, this generated a lot of discussion amongst our team and with some of the city staff folks the first time we went through this presentation. So we looked at the history of the ones that we've lost, uh, as well as the ones that we still have. Um, the geometry is, is 
kind of similar, but it's interesting to note that most of the existing arches, like you see at Mama Mushroom and at Binks and uh, over at the attorney offices in the northwest corner of the square, these have been modified to create more of a, an entry uh, with, with some bracketing and a transom in the upper portion of the arch uh, for, for those that are still standing today. Um, really in a pretty consistent infill language from what you see from the old historic stables. Um, it, these are some other case studies of how arches are present in other uh, vibrant uh, downtown districts. In Savannah, um, the Savannah College of Art and Design maintains a, a shop and boutique where they sell artwork that some of the staff and students have done. They've got uh, very large repeated arches with um, brick detailing uh, entrance at the corner, but each of these creates those storefront openings um, that um, similar to what we have on Main Street, but in a more rectilinear form. Um, the Apple Store in Italy has grand arches, but with the same sort of subdivision treatment between the base and the transom that we see here in Franklin. And then um, this was an, just another example at the Sydney Theater here where they use a rather grand arch to help signify the entrance of the theater building and introduced a canopy to help drop the scale, subdividing between that base and, and transom approach, but maintaining the geometry of the arch uh, across that, that portion of the building. As we look at uh, other elements, and this is where we're gonna come into discussion points with you all, there are, uh, here's four case studies that start to do some of the things that we've talked about. Um, as, as you know, city hall buildings aren't built every day and they're really not built every day in smaller uh, historic Southern towns. So finding new city halls in places similar to Franklin uh, is not as easy as, as you might think. So we looked at other uh, types of similar towns with vibrant Main Street districts with low to mid rise, new construction happening to blend with um, the urban streetscape of a Main Street and uh, pedestrian, you know, pedestrian activity like we have um, and how these different communities have done that. So we wanted to share a couple of things that deal with issues uh, that we are seeing in, the, uh, in our city hall site. So um, the use of, of brick and stone um, is consistent. Uh, let me scroll down. This is Mount Pleasant, which is uh, essentially Charleston, South Carolina. Mount Pleasant has its own uh, town hall and is across the river for those of you that have been there, which I imagine are most people. Uh, Montclair, New Jersey and Birmingham, Michigan may be two areas you're not as familiar with, but these buildings really spoke to us in terms of how this could potentially be an anchor along Third Avenue uh, and create uh, a much more pedestrian friendly streetscape at a human scale and help break up the massing of the building uh, as, as it goes vertical and then even step back at the top. Um, this is uh, a villa in Potsdam, Germany. Um, it, this will become a little more apparent later, but we started to talk about whether as a civic building, uh, classical architecture or neoclassical architecture might uh, be appropriate since we're not creating a retail building. Um, this Montclair, uh, New Jersey building, we felt really anchored the corner uh, of its site very well, had a really strong base, middle, top. Uh, it changed expression at the top, which is probably a little contemporary for uh, our context but is a new building being built in a historic uh, condition. We really identified with this reveal to help um, create this solid anchor at the block and then also maintain the edge along the street here. Uh, the Mount Pleasant City Hall, this, is, this one actually is a, a town hall uh, in, in uh, a historic community. However, this is a more suburban version of it. Uh, it's also a LEED certified building and LEED certification is going to be a requirement for our building. Um, so we wanted to look at how they handled things like the rhythm, the materials, some of the louvers for daylight, 
Um, they created a porch on the end for outdoor public gatherings, um, which also created a little bit more of a civic anchor on the end of the building as you approach from this direction. Um, so I have larger slides of each of these um, to, to help point out some of these uh, same points. Again, the clearly defined base, maintaining the street edge along Third Avenue. Uh, we've talked about the potential for mixed use and some other businesses and activities potentially uh, having a home in, in City Hall. Um, we, how we break up the massing as we go vertical, uh, and the opportunity for some rooftop terraces or green roofs. Um, daylight is going to be a very important uh, characteristic of the new building for us on the lead standpoint. Um, the exterior materials in this building, while you see the, the rhythm of the coursing in, the, in their brick, um, it's a little bit more monolithic than some of the other options. Uh, this does have the punched window openings above the uh, storefront and it has canopies at the entrances. Uh, in this case, this building's a little bit taller than we would probably uh, be in our uh, specific site, uh, but they used a larger punched opening to tie these two floors together and uh, help uh, emphasize the top with the smaller punched window openings. Um, and then they still maintain a very vertical rhythm similar to what we see in downtown Franklin, especially along Main Street and the square. The uh, Montclair building, again, this shows a little bit more of it than the initial slide did. So you can see how the building actually turns and changes uh, to a different color of brick. So it really uh, emulates a little bit more of, of a streetscape uh, in the downtown context. Uh, the downtown, again, supports the potential for uh, mixed use and introduces a very pedestrian scale with the canopies at the entrances and the rhythm and scale of where this space starts and um, carries a pretty wide band uh, here at, at this level um, to, to help with the higher floor to floor heights. There's the same potential for rooftop access up on this roof, um, the punched window openings uh, and the same vertical rhythm where this, this reveal and break in the block of the building helps really define the street edge along this overall facade, but reinforce the vertical rhythm and anchor this, this corner uh, here at the street. Uh, Mount Pleasant, again, this is a new city hall in a, in a historic township. Uh, it's using brick and stone materials. It has punched window openings. Uh, it is a suburban location rather than a more urban location like downtown Franklin. Uh, it does have elements like the porch and the louvers that um, are helping them meet their lead certification needs. You can see where the entrance is, is expressed with a little bit different architecture uh, here at this end. And they, you know, there's just a balance of how they uh, approach the lead requirements with the traditional character and this is a little bit more modern interpretation of some of the traditional elements that you'll find in Mount Pleasant. And then the, um, the, the idea of whether the classical style might be appropriate since we are a government building and a civic building as opposed to um, a, a Main Street uh, retail mixed use building it, that tends to come with some different materials and detailing um, I think we have uh, a little bit of a question. The courthouse does a beautiful job of uh, blending style between the significance of the courthouse uh, with the, the surrounding buildings rather than contrasting too much. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to mimic the courthouse and take away from it and, and uh, show it any disrespect as we flank either side of Third Avenue there. Those are two government buildings that will uh, straddle Third Avenue, uh, both facing north on the south end of the square. We have the relationship of city and county government, um, the similarities and differences in the roles of the building on the square, something we wanna talk to you all about and uh, your thoughts on how we start to 
balance the historic and new construction so that we still um, stay sensitive to downtown Franklin and, the, and its presence on the square. Uh, and then the plaza, the idea of the plaza in the front, um, there's been a lot of discussion about maintaining that stage use in front of City Hall, and yet there really isn't uh, it, enough stage space to support some of the festivals and bigger events. If there's a band, then there's not much room for somebody to sit uh, unless the streets are closed. And, and should we have a plaza that addresses, um, you know, this being a civic building and changes something about the geometry or spacing of the front of, of that, uh, of the city hall as it fronts the square. And then I've just for reference, I had the site notes here again, because I figure most of our discussion will be here on these last couple of slides uh, for the case studies um, that, that we've introduced to demonstrate some of these different um, design details and things that we have, um, that we've found. So that was a, a bit of a rush through things. I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, I would, at this point, um, Amanda, what do you think best? Should we go back up here to this slide? And yes, I think that's discussion? Mm -hmm. um, I might let you, um, prompt a little discussion amongst people or, or let, let y'all jump in. Um, as I say, we are not um, showing any of these necessarily to say, hey, here's what we're going to do because we don't know yet. We're in that public engagement, input, feedback, feedback um, research point of the project. And you all are our best historic authority for architecture, character, massing, and scale in the downtown context. Uh, something after working on the 231 Public Square building in particular, Ann Ruth and I are very familiar with and sensitive to on, uh, in the downtown context. So with that, I'm gonna be quiet and let you all ask mm -hmm. some questions or make some comments. And we, we want to listen and if we can answer questions, I um, what, wherever you guys want to go from here. And we I can, can certainly go to each individual slide so you can see those individual buildings more clearly if that's something you want to do. Um, I, I do want to say one thing before we get started. Um, please don't be alarmed by the scale of any of these. Our anticipation at a maximum is three stories with a fourth recessed. Um, Kelly, if, if that's off, please, please chime in. But that would be what would be permitted in our community at that location. It would be three stories. You know, three stories. We're, okay, we're great. Looking. That's what I was hoping to hear. <laughs> Matt, this is a little off the topic a little bit, but I, I think it's, I'd be interested in knowing y'all's thoughts about office use in light of the pandemic and how that impacts what you're going to be planning to do inside whatever is developed as far as a structure. Because I think we're headed into a, a foreseeable future that the need for the same amount of office space that we would have had in 2018, 19 is not the same going forward for the next several years anyway. Um, especially as I travel around Franklin now, especially in the Cool Springs area, there are any number of four lease signs um, mm -hmm. that are apparent. So I don't know how that's factoring into what y'all have you're thinking at this stage, but I, I wanted to say that since I'd probably forget it if I didn't just blurt it out there. <laughs> no, it, it's it's a great question, Jim, and it's one that um, we're we're paying attention to, and I don't think there's a, a specific definitive answer to at this point. Um, there's a lot of different ways of addressing that from the standpoint of, um, even the city, much like many of the businesses and companies around the whole Middle Tennessee area are finding that there are some uh, folks that work successfully from home and that there are avenues for that which reduces the need for space to house people. Um, some city services absolutely need people where folks can come meet with them, uh, pay their bills, apply for permits, and that's a bit of a programmatic balance that we are still in the stages of meeting with all the city staff to talk to them about. And 
And that could look entirely different a year from now. Uh, yeah. As vaccinations roll out, um, it may be that we need a home for everybody in City Hall, but we want to maintain a certain spacing. Uh, we may It may affect the physical uh, environment where we have an open office environment, but provide a little bit of separation between uh, individuals where they might sit next to each other. Um, and then I think we just want to build in things like flexibility for AV to allow these kinds of meetings to happen so that you all and, and Board of Mayor and Alderman and Planning Commission can continue to hold meetings, but having it, uh, the infrastructure there in the building to allow people to attend where they may not feel comfortable attending in person um, and or have more frequent meetings as needed. So there's a lot of moving pieces and parts to that question, and I don't have an answer for you. I, I didn't expect I didn't reasons why it would get would. reasons why it would get smaller, and we're working through all of the pros and cons and value assessments of that with um, each of the city departments and, and the and the city administration group as as we go. And since so we have about 20 minutes left, we'd love to hear what you guys think that space, however big it ends up being, looks like from the outside. <laughs> yeah, that's where we really want to focus <laughs> time. This is really important to get your feedback at this early stage before we even take it out to the general public on you know, what elements could you see working well on this quadrant of the square what aspects of these different inspirational images do you like? What do you not like? What do you think could work well? What is it about the massing and scale and facade breaks that you might like over other examples that, that Matt has shown today? So we really want to focus your time you know, on materials, colors, you know, as much detail as you can give us on what your initial thoughts are about what will create a successful city hall on this important quadrant of the square would be really helpful to us. So I have a couple okay. questions um, which would impact my thoughts on those things. And one is, is are, are we look, I mean, it says that we're considering mixed use. I know there was some discussion on allowing retail space maybe on the first floor and then city offices above that. Um, which if that is the case, I would love for us to consider doing something similar with a parking garage like they've done in downtown Huntsville, because I think that that could make it more appealing um, street view wise. And then the other question I have is, are we talking about putting the entrance to City Hall on Public Square and getting it off of Third Avenue? Is that also part of the mix considerations? I think that's one of those questions we're looking for feedback on, uh, um, because we're Security is not particularly tight in the existing city hall with multiple entrances in so many different places. And it's it's definitely, as we look to build a 100 year building ahead, going to be a concern. So um, we obviously need a presence on the square and on Third Avenue. And what are y'all's thoughts about that and to, relative to access and how those, what sort of presence those buildings have on those, those edges? Now I'm not the designer or the historian on the commission, but I will throw that I, I do I love the idea of putting the entrance to city hall back on public square because historically it's been there. And so what a great way to sort of nod towards the history of that, maybe even having a similar, not identical, not even trying to be identical, but you know, sign built into the front facade. I, I love the idea of activating Third Avenue in a way that hasn't been activated in quite a while. I mean, obviously, again, there's a history for that because there used to be a mall there. And so doing that in a way that can activate that street and, and kind of spread some of the, the joy that we have in downtown towards that direction. Um, and as far as breaks and stuff like that, one of the things that's come to mind for me is 99 Main. And some of my fellow commissioners may not feel this way, but I, I don't view the way that we use the brick color to break up the facade as a success. Those brick colors are a little too similar to me and they don't, they don't quite break up and flow in the way that I think we were hoping to do. And so I would like us to not replicate that. And this is uh, Nick. Um, thank you so much, Matt, for putting this together. Um, I'm new to the commission. Um, this is, I found this really helpful uh, and interesting. 
Um, I, I just want to provide my thoughts on the retail piece of this. I, cause like Kelly, I think that's going to have a huge impact as we've seen on this, whether it's, if there's a retail component, I think it's going to look uh, significantly different. I, I'm a little bit hesitant to include retail on the bottom floor of this, just because of the volatility of retail. Um, if we have a volatile retail period and some of those spaces go vacant, that is going to have a very distinct look on the remainder of the building uh, for office space. And with that being downtown, that, that just makes me, me nervous. Um, I, I think in today's market, we're, it looks great. I think we'll have the, the tenants there. Uh, but if there's ever a downturn and those tenants are vacating, tough. it's tough luck. And there's not much you can do with the space. Um, so with this being a civic use, I, I do have a lot of heartburn with the, with the retail. Um, and so with that, I would, be, I would probably vote against the retail for those reasons. Um, and I did like the New Jersey uh, building. I think it was New Jersey where you could scroll down just a hair. Nope, I'm sorry, uh, the Michigan. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that one, yes, thank you. Uh, South Carolina. Um, I like how it has a different front. I, I don't love how those connects were. Those are two very different. I, I don't love the building as a whole, but I do envision from the city square side, having some sort of entrance to city hall that's very welcoming uh, and maybe a little bit distinct like that. I like that. Um, but as Kelly, I'm not the historian, but I do think that would be, um, you know, maybe we can incorporate the arches there um, on the front. So that, that's just my thoughts, but thanks again for the presentation. You bet, thank you guys. Yeah, and if I could chime in, this is Lisa. Um, the, um, the idea of the retail, I agree with Nick a hundred percent on that. It's, it's actually kind of a, a surprise to me that, uh, that this is not going to be specifically a, uh, civic building for government use. And, um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that I wasn't expecting it. And I agree with Nick that the retail has too much volatility um, and uh, unpredictability, and I, I would uh, I would not want to see that if possible. Uh, I also, I guess, would you describe the the picture that we're looking at now? Would that be what you would call a, a, a class a, a neoclassical or? What, what would you call that? No, I, I'd, I'd say that's more contemporary, really. Contemporary, right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so, got a lot of modern influences and it yeah. got some arrangements that yeah. speak to some historic um, um, you know, relationships, but I certainly wouldn't call it traditional. No, uh, um, and, and I guess that that building uh, that was in Germany, the one that you were showing as an example, um, I thought that was, uh, was very elegant. And one of the things you said that struck a chord was the fact that, that um, because it is a government building, you, you certainly don't want to mimic the courthouse or try to mimic other historic buildings in the public square and perhaps keep it some, uh, a somewhat, somewhat contemporary um, just to, to make it different. Um, so Lisa, is your um, comment uh, stating that this is a contemporary feel for you? Well, how would you describe that? A, this is a very classical style. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that that's the one that appealed to me, the classical, uh, which I think still is 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 a nice contrast um, in in relationship to the other buildings in in the public square. Um, you know, I I don't envy you. I think it's going to be challenging, but. Um, one of the things I appreciate is that that you're not going to try to mimic the courthouse. I think that's important. Um, I also heard you say something about having having a private residence in that building. What? No, I think th this building actually is a private residence. Uh -huh. uh, 
but but I, there wouldn't be any residential use in the new. Oh, building. okay. And, I, I, and didn't I don't know. don't let me misconstrue the retail. There's been some discussion of if there's support retail that supports some of the city functions, or maybe some future space that the city would expand into could be short-term retail. Um, there, there's, there's no set program for that yet. That's part of all of this early programmatic uh, discussion that we're having with okay. the city. So I don't want everybody to get hung up that you're, you're throwing a mixed use at us. <laughs> we, we, may we may wind up there, but yeah. this is, and, and so we appreciate the feedback. From Thank you, you for clarifying that, yeah. Yeah, I don't want that to be the big uh, scary thing that y'all heard today because yeah. we're really and, far more important about building form yeah. and style and detailing and the massing and how I think a, a couple of you have mentioned how the building you know should should have an entrance or a presence on yeah. the square which and, certainly we and all height, as you know um, the height of of this is going to be extremely important and one of the slides that that was really helpful is the one that where you showed a um uh like a a, a dashed red line mm -hmm. that went over the proposed uh as well as the as 231 yeah mm -hmm. there you go um so my final comment would be that contextually uh 231 I think would be uh, determinative as far as the height is concerned. Um, so do you have one that shows 231 on the? Right yeah. there. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and here. Yeah. So th those would be my comments. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Hey, Matt, this is Brian Laster. Uh, appreciate your presentation. And I would like to uh, fall into the camp of both Nick and Lisa on the retail portion of it. Uh, I do think this is a public building and it, it should say it's a public building and be a public building. And actually the Potsdam building that you showed in that classical or neoclassical form uh, struck me as something that does say a public building. Uh, I would also advocate for something that's brick and stone so it blends into the square and nothing that actually uh, just, you know, really stands out on its own. Uh, you mentioned about being in line with the courthouse. When, when we look at Abram Murray's original plan of Franklin, he creates a town square. And I know we've, we've created a roundabout for the traffic flow, but I, I think it, it's important to maintain that, that feel of a town square. And, and I would say an entrance on the public square would, would be preferable. Um, and that's, those are my comments. Uh, Matt, this is Mary. And um, I would say having lived in Mount Pleasant, uh, I mean, to pick out that there's a front entrance, I suppose, but I don't think that slide in my mind speaks to what we need in Franklin. Uh, that Mount Pleasant never really had a downtown and uh, it's all recreated. And um, I do agree with LEED certified. We did that on the old old jail and the Franklin theater. And I think you did that on uh, the police station so I, I, I get that, but I, and I concur on the retail space. I, I would not be a fan of that. I would, before I go any, I prefer the classical looking building, but before I could give any comment on whether it reads as one building or two building, I, I think we need buildings. I think we need to understand what the massing of this is going to be. And I know you've still got that work in progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, absolutely, Mary. And that, that's where we wanted to get some of y'all's feedback on, um, you know, there. I think the first two case studies deal with massing in two uh -huh. different but successful ways. Um, yeah. And so we wanted to get y'all's comments to see if you liked one of them, both of them, 
you know, like pieces of each one, um, you know, really, really any feedback you guys have. We're, we're in the listening mode right now. We're not. Yeah, I, I think for yet. me, uh, the ones you show with it breaking up into two buildings, um, I hope that doesn't have to happen, but it may get big enough that it does have to happen. But I, I do agree with um, it having presence on the square. Uh, having uh, done just a few festivals in my time, uh, addressing the needs of the festivals is um, tricky. Um, I think um, if that can be considered great, uh, I do think that uh, there will never be a festival without a street closure of any of the major festivals. And in my mind, we're going to meet some of those needs. Um, hopefully one day, Matt, um, if you're not my age at the time, I, I knew Matt. I'm getting closer, Mary. <laughs> I knew, I knew Matt when he was young. Yes, but I'm running ahead and I, we always, I know Matt and I always envisioned that Bicentennial Park would be an alternative uh, place for staging. And as the town gets bigger and things grow, uh, I think we are going to have to even spread out beyond the street closure. So, um, you know, taking, all, I wouldn't want that to be a driver, a consideration. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. This um, has been talked about for 20 years at least. And I'm, I'm so excited it's getting done. And I'm so excited that the people that work at City Hall might have a window one day. We are too. <laughs> how, how oh, the other feel? comment. When we say stone, I am for limestone trim. I am not for stone. I think Matt knows why I'm not. That can go south quickly. And uh, so I am absolutely for limestone detailing. Got it. Relative to that, that sort of stage and the presence on the square, do, do y'all have strong feelings for or against the idea of does the building plane need to line up with the courthouse to hold that edge or if we had a plaza in the front space and there were potentially some steps or other elements to help define that plaza to create more of an open space that the building edge might not line up with the square. I don't think it should be forward of the courthouse, but if we pulled it back, do you, how, how do, Matt, you, do you mind going to that slide, please? We're getting really short on time, so. Yeah, so we have the courthouse here and I think there's, no matter what, we have a definite relationship to this this size, the massing, especially since it falls into the rhythm of, of the street here. Um, we This black line represents that, that front edge of the courthouse. Um, the square would come across, uh, obviously from 231 here, but if, if a plaza maintained this and the building edge potentially came back, does that, do y'all love that? Do you hate that? Do you not know? Um, we're, we're trying to think about everything we can think about at this point, basically, you know, and, and so make sure that we get some feedback on the different ways to use the space, use the square and establish that setting and the presence for the, the city hall um. I would like to, uh, I'm still getting my head wrapped around this, quite frankly, <laughs> but <laughs> I have to say, I, uh, I, know. I have to say, Matt, that it's a beautiful presentation and I'm so excited. Uh, if you could, you know, I'm going to have to send my comments in because I think I really need to think about it pretty hard, mm -hmm. but I will say one of the things I, I loved is that you brought in the stable elements. And, uh, and I think that could be very uh, significant. And the thing I think is gonna be, and I know this is, you know, but you know, you did such a good job with 231 and it's like, but you can't, you know, it's got to be different than that. 
And I think that's the challenge for you is making it different. And, and, and I know you can do that, but, but still, cause you were bringing in all these elements from the context of the square and, you know, talking about the building that was there before that. So at any rate, I'm going to mail my comments in if that's okay. I'll email them. Sure. Well, and, and keep in mind this, you, we're coming to you guys at the front end of this, this process where there's going to be a lot more public engagement starting. Um, and Kelly can certainly speak to that a little bit more, but this will not be the first, the last time we come talk to you guys. And we've got years ahead of us to get this project done. So this is going to be an ongoing conversation. What we want to do is, is get started. We have a million possibilities. Um, we, I think we understand a lot of the things that are important about downtown and this site in particular, which we hopefully demonstrated at least some of those today in this presentation, but there's a lot of different ways we can go with with some of those things, and we can, and still maintain and respect some of those those uh, elements. So that's Kathy what Kathy and Jim. Um, sorry to interrupt, Matt. Um, mm -hmm. Kathy and Jim, do you have any comments about the exterior? Uh, Kathy, you go ahead. Okay, Dick. Hi, Jim, um, Matt, and um, Anna Ruth. Thank you. Um, I do like that idea of the plaza um, as opposed to, you know, the, the footprint or the matching the line of the courthouse. I think it'd be interesting to see how that could be developed because really from a, a person's street eye view, sometimes you may not get that relationship lining up building to building. And I think it would also be an opportunity to study at mass. It might be a way to reduce building mass yet incorporate a bigger plaza festival. I think it'll, it could possibly identify the square uh, even more so and also accentuate uh, front entrance to city hall from that uh, facade. So I think that would be nice to see that, I really do. Of all the buildings, the one that least um, favors me is the Mount Juliet. Um, only because I just feel it's a little too contemporary, but it's the massing I think is, it, it doesn't really I find give us a better look than what's already there. If I just had to squint at it and look at it, um, I could see the existing building just being jacked up about another 10 feet and you know, <laughs> pop some windows in it. And it almost has that same feel to me. So that's my least favorite. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. That's all, all very helpful. Matt, I think the, the, the Birmingham, Michigan has some appeal to me because I think it does break up. I like that idea, not necessarily the height. Not, I do like the concept that you've got there. I like the step back on the top. Uh, and I think that's got a lot of possibilities to break up what is now just a, a one story blob that extends down Third Avenue. Um, so again, a lot of the detail, I'm not interested in the, I'm not commenting on the color and all that. That's something that could be worked out. I think brick and stone and limestone, Mary, would be the proper way to treat that. But I, I do like that idea. Um, it's, I, I just had, I, I really can't talk about whether it lines up with the courthouse or not, or whether it should, I, I don't know. I mean, on, on the surface, it seems like, but I just have to see how this progresses. Um, I, there are, and I do, I did notice on your plan that the parking on the, um, on the right, well, the far side of the, um, what is now Oops. outside Just the street. training room would go away. I'm assuming you're going to go down underneath this facility, new facility with additional parking. Is that correct? And we're uh, not, we're not there yet, Jim. I don't okay. know certainly going to explore that we're going to explore a lot of things but. yeah I, I think that does need to be explored mm -hmm. so certainly down but i think the um the the birmingham michigan design the concept appeals to me um right. so and as far as the the high i think lisa commented on this i think the key height thing maybe should be 231 um because i think that's that's such a good project as it turned out. Um, and I, th I think that this would be r right along there. So that, I mean, that's, that's all that I've got at this, at this juncture. 
Thanks, Jim. The, the, everybody's comments are, are super helpful. Uh, really helps paint a picture and nar we narrow a few things down. We know what we're, th we're open to things and things we might let's start steering away from and oh the the other one quick comment on the on the retail obviously i i would i would be in favor of no retail you've got to have some, you're planning a 75 to 100 year building though you got to do something with space that's not going to be immediately utilized so that you have to put something in there mm -hmm. um whether it's retail whether it's some type of office space whether it's space for nonprofits to use because United Way was in City Hall at one time uh, for, for one, and I think there were some other ones too. So mm -hmm. those are things to think about um, because of the life that you really hope to get out of this building. Uh, the other thing I would say, my on the height, uh, as you get down to the residential area, it mm -hmm. would be nice if, I, if the height or at least a green setback or something helped um, soften that. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. And I just quickly wanted to say that uh, I think Kathy hit the nail on the head regarding the plaza. Uh, I, I concur with everything she said about the, the plaza concept. Well, I, I, I agree with what uh, she said about the building that uh, I, the Mount Pleasant, as you all know, I'm not a fan, but I do think you could almost envision what we have with that front on it, and there you go. <laughs> which, which Matt, Matt, good thing. <laughs> Matt, this is Brian. Could you explain your plaza concept a little bit more? What would its purpose be? Well, there are the the city. Um, Sometimes, sometimes the city holds events. Sometimes the Heritage Foundation holds events, and this corner of the square is the one that always serves as the stage side. It doesn't have some of the other obstacles of the planters and trees that the other sides do. It's a little more open. Right now, there's a little bit of a plaza. Uh, I, I wouldn't really even call it a plaza, but there's there's a porch uh, on the front of a raised brick area that aligns with this pedestrian alley. Uh, that connects over to the garage. Um, but there are times where this is where the, the stage function would be. And it, it could even grow into where um, the mayor holds his annual address um, or other city proclamations. I think it, um, it, it's very common for municipal or civic public buildings to have a plaza in front of them. And so there's, um, you can look at it as the square is the plaza, or we really need something that's more functional relative to this portion of the square. And, and then just the relationship of the, the front of the building or, or that face of the building to the courthouse and whether they align with each other or we show some deference, you know, how do we maintain the edge of the square? I think that's, that's definitely important, but there's a lot of different ways to handle that. Um, and so um, there's there's just a lot of different possibilities. And uh, as I say, Brian, we're, we are we don't have a, a design to propose to anybody yet on that. It's really more of an exploration question of, mm -hmm. oh, I love that or I hate that. Um, is, it, is it worth exploring? Um, those kinds of ideas and and starting to see well oh that's how it could work and that's how it, what it could look like and um, and yeah. adding to that uh, plazas can really help a building feel more civic in use and plazas can really help break up mass and because this is an entire block face some of the concerns we've had expressed internally staff and, and the consultants is that we want to make sure that this doesn't feel like a continual wall from one intersection to the other. So um, using those plazas um, to help break up the mass particularly, but also, you know, define, you know, entrances and places where we want people to gather um, can be really helpful in, in, in shaping that form. Uh, I wonder if there are any other questions or comments. Vernon joined us um, and he would like to make some comments uh, before we wrap up. 
Well, thank you, thank you, Amanda, and um, appreciate everybody taking time out of their day to to participate in this important meeting and and getting introduced to what we're envisioning um, for our new city hall on the square. I thought I'd, I'd like after I apologize not being able to jump on right when you started, but um, I did want to share a few points, and and the first one is that your input over the next few months is vital um, to, as we have the public engagement process to talk about what this civic building will be for generations to come is incredibly important because one of the things that the Board of Mayor and Aldermen did when they approved a selected um, OHM advisors and Matt and Studio 8 and their team was they intentionally have a phased funding approach to the design of this and redevelopment of this corner. And the, the first phase is really the public engagement process that will get us to the end of the year in which we'll hopefully um, get in front of the board with recommendations from various committees and commissions on um, the next phase, which will be schematic design. And that'll take us to the end of 2019 or 2022. Um, and the reason they did that is because when we started the conversation and had gone through the proposal request, we got into COVID and we didn't know what COVID was gonna bring for us um, as a community. So they are, are very, being very prudent in how to go forward with, with redeveloping this, this site. So um, invite you, encourage you to be engaged in as many meetings as possible, offer input um, of how this site will look and function so we get it right. Um, I appreciate the, the comments on the retail use and particularly Jim Roberts because he hit it right on the head. We have done a space need analysis and reviewed it, re-reviewed it, re-reviewed it and continue to re-review it to try to project what we'll need for generations to come. And actually we're looking out you know, about 20, 20 years or so um, and what we've learned that with COVID, that people work differently and technology is changing ever so quickly that we don't know exactly what we thought we needed over a year ago. So having extra space to grow into is important and how we utilize that space is yet to be determined. But Jim, Jim hit it right on the head. It would be wise for us to make sure that we have space to grow into because um, we do know that Franklin's a very desirable place to, to raise a family and to grow a business and we'll probably experience a little bit of growth in the years ahead. So that's where that comes from. And the other part, my role in working with Kelly and Joe and Amanda and our, our team is to, to stay on track with the schedule. And with any luck, we'll be moving into a new city hall in about five years, provided we can convince the Board of Mayor and Aldermen to, to fund it and things keep going in the right direction. So thank you for indulging me. Appreciate the comments. Looking forward to seeing you at the many public engagement meetings throughout um, the next several months and we'll go from there. Let me, uh, Susan Besser touched on a, uh, one point, which is I think uh, important and we may want to do there. Could, we will have other thoughts uh, as in the, over the next few days. Would uh, Amanda, would you like commissioners to direct those to you in an email or go to Matt or how, how do we need to handle that? Um, please send those to me and I'll be happy to disseminate okay. those to our consultant team. Because that was Amanda, a good if, if, 
that Susan made a good point about that. And we'll be back before you, uh oh, Vernon, you're muted. Yes, if, if I may, and I, I don't mean, I mean this in a, in a very kind way. I hope your comments aren't only limited to the next two or three days. Uh, we expect them to keep coming throughout this process. This group has no problem in making comments. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be in front of the public with a uh, virtual family room chat in May. And then we'll be back before you again at a special call DRC meeting in May as well. So you've got time to process. We gave you a lot of information and elements to think about tonight. So please feel free to think about them for a very long time. You can email us this week, but also there's another opportunity in May specifically for you all to come back and uh, give us some additional feedback and comments. Okay, well, thank, thanks to uh, Matt, and Anna Ruth, and everybody for comments tonight. It really was a good presentation, good eye-opening for a first step, Matt. So thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I think we guess, I guess, unless it's something else, I guess we need a motion to adjourn this thing, this meeting tonight, if somebody will make it. So moved. Thank you, Mary. Is there a second? Second. Who was that? Who's Kelly. Kelly. <laughs> Okay, then please respond when I call your name. Kelly Baker. Aye. Susan Besser. Aye. Brian Laster. Aye. Nick Mann. Aye. Lisa Marquard. Aye. Mary Pierce. Aye. Kathy Worthington. Aye. And Jim Roberts. Aye. Thank you all so much. Very, very Thank informative. You. Thank you all. Good to see everybody. Bye.